Okay, folks, how's it going? I can already see a lot of commotion in the chat. I can see two amazing hackers back for my stream. Yasha and Ashish, welcome back. Uh, oh, Polar Void is back as well. Welcome back, Polar Void. He was an amazing participant in Play Morning's workshop with me. Hello. Hello, I can see some amazing folks here already. Hi, Santiago is back. Welcome back. RPG is back. That is amazing, folks. And I'm so glad to see so many of you all back today. We're going to do a very simple session. If you all want, we'll go over the data sheets again in case you all have any questions from uh, morning. And Sarah Frosted is back. Awesome, folks. I see a new person here, Chet. Were you there in the morning? I'm sorry if I missed you. Awesome. So uh, I'm going to, you know, wait for a couple of people to trickle in. I gave a pretty uh, extensive introduction in the morning, so we'll probably skip that. But yeah, today's session is supposed to be nice, very simple. We'll play around. Uh, I'll take suggestions from you all, maybe make mistakes, see if it even, you know, is possible. But today we're going to be checking out virtual hardware. So last uh, GHW Khalid did an amazing session on using Tinkercad. I am going to be trying using a different emulator. I'm also going to drop a link to some other emulators that aren't very flexible, but they work pretty well. All right. So uh, I'm sorry, I missed the chat totally. Uh, no, Asprey, the star stream is just starting. We have started like literally a minute back. Ah, uh, yep, it's just starting. I can imagine RPJ. Feel free to, you know, take a break from this whenever you want. This is a recorded session. I'll be back tomorrow morning. Uh, I think 9.30 a.m. tomorrow, which is pretty early for me, but I'll be back 9.30 Yes, Ashish, exactly. So it'll be like uh, Tinkercad was covered last time. Fritzing also was a tad bit covered last time by Khaled. An amazing session. You all should totally check it out if you all want to use Tinkercad. But I'll be covering a new uh, website called Wokwe. Yes, RPG, thank you so much for bringing that up. So the check-in link is not working because this session was actually supposed to happen on the first day. And then I kind of got sick. I was down the entire weekend. So this was moved to first tomorrow and now back to today because I understand that, you know, the session was kind of necessary between the first session and the second IoT session. But yeah, it, it, it will be working by the end of the session. If not, don't worry. Mary will let you know she's been working really hard and she's super swamped. So let's give her some time to fix the OHQ link. When it's fixed, we'll know. I have my Slack open. And yeah, she let us know and I'll drop the link when it's ready to go. But before we get started, I do want to share the dev posting for today because we are running a hardware challenge. And that is something I would surely like to see all participate in. Oh, Ashish, I'm so sorry to see you miss uh, another stream, but that's okay. Best of luck to your exam, okay? Ashish, by the way, is an all-time cup stacking winner. He's won so many cup stacking events, almost consecutively, two GHWs now. Hi, Techlogology. Uh, I, is, does that word mean something, Logology, or is that supposed to be a play on some technical word I do not understand? It's going to be at 9.30 a.m. tomorrow, uh, Ashish, if you can come without missing your exam, sure. Otherwise, we're going to have Chrome Dino the day after that. You're welcome to join that. And we'll just let you do some, you know, uh, legacy cup stacking on the side. Hi there. Welcome back, Manasvi Priya. Manasvi Priya was there in the morning. And uh, she also had some pretty great insights into what we were doing. Cup stacking is this really cool event where I moderate and you all try to build a huge tower. Now, uh, you know, traditionally it's supposed to be cups, but we stack anything. Last time, uh, she stacked books and cardboards and whatnot. Uh, one of the GHWs people ended it with bots and glasses. It was very cute. Y'all should totally go and check out those streams on YouTube. Hi there, Abhinav. I forgot my name is back. That is amazing. I think I got, lost you after a couple of minutes in the morning session. But welcome back. Ah, that is nice. I, I, I'm learning something that is awesome. Hi, Arjun. Welcome back. I know a few folks who didn't comment in the morning, but you all went and followed me on my social media prof profiles. I knew you were there. So I, I keep a watch. 
Hi there, Specbeck. I know, right? It is very creative. Hi there, welcome back, Lord Cub. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. I don't even know at this point. Yes, I agree. Ashish's uh, username is very, very creative. Uh, Ashish, do you want to take a second and explain it in the chat? Feel free to do that. I'm happy to do it. Right. Oh, imaginary. I'm sad that you have to say imaginary. I know the swag's been a little bit late in India. It, it happens. But once you start getting it, trust me, it does not stop. So you just need to wait for it to start coming. Hi there, Matt. Welcome to the session. All right, folks, so uh, I'm going to share uh, the dev post page to show you all that the challenge that we're running today. It's going to be a very chill stream tonight. We're going to be building a very simple thing. What I really want you all to understand in this stream is, okay, there are a lot of virtual emulators out there. I'll show you a couple how to use them. What I really want you all to understand is how to use the data sheet and how to use the online resources to put your project together. So we will open up our emulator. We'll see the components available. We'll see why we want to use which component. We'll look up the component, see how the component works, and then we'll actually write some code and run it. All right? There we go. Oh, Ritesh is back. Hi, Ritesh. So the C is pronounced as S, so Lord Sir. So I've been saying it correct all along. RPJ, he just answered, and it's kind of very cool. The amount of effort that the poor thing is put in it is amazing. Folks, a friend of mine is just messaging. I might just call them on to the stream in a bit. Give me one second. All right, let's see if they join in. Uh, the person who might join is a gold MLSE. They are currently working in Microsoft. And I think they have an amazing experience when it comes to IoT and Azure in general. So let's see if, OK, they are willing to join in. So let me quickly share the link to them. And I know you all love making new friends. So let's invite them very quickly. Give me just one second, folks. But uh, keep the chat going. We're going to be doing some very cool stuff today, and I can't wait for you all to get started. In the meantime, please go ahead and check out the dev post page that I've shared in the link in the chat. And uh, all right. If you ever lose stuff, then you really need to find them. For example, I have almost at any given point 800 tabs open, so I never find what I'm searching for in that moment. Give me just one second. I shall find my friend's email ID, send them the link, and then I'll come back. So this person I'm talking about has done multiple uh, themes for Microsoft Reactor. And there we go. So the link's gone. Hopefully, they'll be joining very soon. But until then, let me share the link to the emulator that we'll be using. I actually spent a good part of my day playing around myself and I realized it's a lot of fun. So I know you all will have fun. So if you all want to go ahead and search for work, we go ahead and do that. Otherwise, I'm pulling up the link right now and there we go. 
Okay. I am sending the link and then I'm going to catch up on the chat very quickly. So the last chat I read was this. I'm so glad Ashish is already excited. Uh, hi, May. Uh, I'm so glad you are here. The check-in link is not working for the time being. As soon as it does, Mary's going to message me and I will send you the link that works. So don't worry about it. Just have fun until then. And all right. Thank you, Wei. I know, right? I have like 800 tabs open at any given point. So someone understands. I'm glad. <laughs> All right. Let's go. So Wokwe is another very cool platform. So the reason I know Wokwe because there's some really cool folks and they're trying to, you know, support these uh, uh, third party platforms and platforms that aren't very famous, for example, the Blues Wireless platform that I work for. So uh, let's figure it out. I really like the Wokwe interface because everything is very transparent in terms of, first of all, it's completely open source. And then you can also see a JSON in which your entire wiring is very visible. Apart from that, what I'm going to do before we do that is I'm going to show you a couple of different, very stringent uh, emulators out there that you all can also use. All right. So let's first uh, open up the emulators that we won't be using. And all right, let me pull up the emulators until then my guest is here. So let me pull up my guest. Let's see. Hi there, Mustafa. You're on Hello. stream. Hi, hi, Mustafa. Hi, how are you? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yes, I can. I'm just answering the chat as well. Ah, there we go. There's Mustafa. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, yes, Yash, all of the emulators that we'll be using today are browser-based. Ah, Ashish already likes Mustafa. That's hmm. great. <laughs> Mustafa, on MLH, you're going to be the three spend now. <laughs> yeah, hi. <laughs> all right. So Mustafa here has an amazing experience. He has a very diverse experience for that matter. He has a lot of experience in AIML. He has a lot of experience in IoT. He has done multiple reactor streams. And uh, yeah, he's here on a very short notice. He messaged me and I'm like, I'm on stream, hop on. And he didn't hop on, which is pretty awesome. So Mustafa, and thank you for inviting me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I keep doing that. I keep pulling people into streams all the time. But most of all, if you see the chat, these are some of the most amazing hackers and the very, very regular. They turn up to almost every stream of mine. So Ashish okay. over here is one of the most regular hackers. He turns up to the same workshop every weekend, but he's always there to support me. Then there is Yash, who's also there all the time at every stream, at every mini event. <laughs> And then today yeah. I've made a lot of new friends. There's Ritesh here. Uh, Zainab is not here. Zel Froster is here. He's another very, very uh, regular hacker. But Mustafa, do you want to turn on your camera and introduce yourself very quickly? I've already told them a lot about you. Okay. But yeah. So hi, everyone. This is Mustafa. Sorry, I cannot join from my laptop because I surrendered my laptop today to Microsoft. <laughs> oh, yeah. So. Mustafa is leaving Microsoft. Do you want to tell them where you did it? Uh, yeah, so I'm joining Amazon uh, from next month onwards. So yeah, I, I have been working on Microsoft Azure developer team uh, for the past one year. And now I have joined Amazon. I'll be joining as a student advocate developer. And my primary job will be to conduct hackathons, conduct seminars, empower the students. I have a background of mechanical, electrical, computer science. That's a very brief history I have about all of these fields. Uh, I also enjoy doing IoT a lot. So this this is the very core thing that me and Ritvi share. And I'm crazy about electronics. So crazy that I had to start a business about it. So there's that. And if you if you have anything to ask me about Microsoft or Amazon or I mean Amazon, it'll take time to understand my it mujhe time lagega like Amazon samajhne ke liye. It's new for me. So I'm thinking about that. But yeah, I mean, that's about me. And uh, I'll just type my LinkedIn, I guess, so that how Sounds this good. platform yeah. is new. Yes, yeah. so I'm going to share Mustafa's LinkedIn in a bit. But apart from that, Mustafa, there are really tons of questions for you. For example, uh, there's one that says, do you know that uh, about the Azure Dev Day that happened all over India? Are you in the same team? 
Oh no 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 no. So Microsoft is huge and there are so many things happening. I'll be honest, Microsoft is one of the best companies. If people say that fang bang whatever it is but in terms of work life flexibility and all of that microsoft is the best and uh, but yeah to answer the question that uh, the azure dev day i am totally not sure about that because we have tons of programs that we conduct so yeah sorry about that all right next question for you yash is asking you is there any student program run by amazon i like how this you know went from a hardware session to q and a very soon but i'm going to give five yes. minutes to ask questions and then we'll go back to hardware okay so here's the thing amazon doesn't have a student program and that is why i am hired that is that's why i am hired that this is the first time that amazon thought that let's have a student program so they thought that who should be contact for a student program so i have been an mlsa microsoft learn student ambassador for 6 years and i have worked with microsoft employees i mean almost in all of the countries so i mean they know that i have worked with them so that's why they thought that why not have a very recent student uh, head this program who can understand hackathons and so that's why I, i i don't want to make this program for myself or by myself i want to make it by the students for the students just like how the government is so that's what my aim is i mean i have like one year to design this and i'll be designing how the student community works and i i, I don't want to make it a corporate thing i i actually want to make it a student thing and my my aim main aim is um um so so i'll tell you whenever you join a student program any students end goal is to get a placement because honestly saying that's why you pay so much for college right you want to get placements and i want to pick that pain point on how we can solve that issue i cannot assure that we will get you a job at amazon or something but you will get a job somewhere so we can suggest you all those appropriate links i mean that's how microsoft is okay again i'm conflicting between two competitive companies <laughs> microsoft and amazon <laughs> but see microsoft in that's microsoft good. we have a rule yes sorry go ahead go ahead yeah so we have a we have the saying that we don't help people we we enable them so that they can help themselves so that's what i am aiming as a student advocate that i can provide you facility i mean that is what i aim I, again i have not done the role actually but that is what i am aiming to enable students to get to crack the job themselves by not depending on the placement cell of your college or waiting for some opportunity to come to your door instead how to hunt these opportunities that is what i am aiming for that uh, is an amazing questions. answer so folks for you just you know as a heads up he'll be doing a lot of research mustafa now that he starts off so follow him uh, stay in touch with him on linkedin i'm sure you all will be able to benefit each other very nicely mustafa next question for you is what's your name of business Okay, my business name is Safi Lighthouse, and I started it in 2018. It is mostly an electronics business where you get land, lights, fans, appliances. So it's a more of a decorative and fancy business. But I'll uh, drop all the yeah. links for you all folks as we go. Just give me, let me just go through the questions, and I'll promise I'll drop the yeah. link later. Next there, question, there Mustafa. Yeah. Go, go, go. Let's just cover the questions and then we can keep talking because I'll probably need someone to talk to anyway. Uh, also, yes. Mustafa, Mustafa, have you used emulators before? Hardware emulators? Uh, other than for Arduino, no, actually. All right, great. So we'll be discovering something new together. Awesome. So mm-hmm. next question for you, Mustafa, is is it daunting starting in a big company such as Microsoft or Amazon and Amazon? Uh, to be honest, it's. the 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 initial phase is very difficult i mean the interviews are very nerve wracking i mean even if you have an ac on you will start sweating about the interviews so that's a very difficult thing to for the for the cracking part but once you get in uh i'll tell you it will be the best feeling of your life the first 5 to 6 months it will be amazing especially microsoft i cannot say the same for amazon and google honestly but for microsoft i can tell you it's an amazing company uh so yeah i mean you have to work hard initially i'll tell you don't focus very much on your gpa but make sure that you have something above 8 and focus on something like doing azure certifications because they value that for freshers but yeah it's it's a bit difficult but not very difficult microsoft is not that difficult honestly Awesome. Great. Next question for you. Uh, before that, I'll address this. Yes, the check-in link is not working right now. Again, Mary 
super swamped. Let's give her some time to fix this. And as soon as it's fixed, I'll know and I'll send you the new link for check-in. All right. Uh, let's see what there are a lot of congratulations for you, Mustafa. Can you see that? Thank you so much. Comments. By yes, yes. There are so yeah. many chats that I'm confused. Yeah. Should I talk or should I read the comments? <laughs> Yeah, we go, we we go uh, very nicely, and we make sure every comment is addressed. That's all right. We have multiple sessions ahead in the week to cover up in case we run short on time. So yes, Ritesh. Uh, right now he isn't. Right now he works for the Azure team, but he will be a DevRel when he joins his Amazon job. Is that correct, Mustafa? Yes, yes, correct. Awesome, and this is an amazing compliment for you, uh, Mustafa. He said Ritesh is saying you created the job that you wanted, which is yeah. awesome. Please go, Yash. Please. Uh, awesome. So I'm just going through the comments, folks. Great, great uh, motivation that you all have here. I'm just making sure that I don't miss out on anything. Uh, so Sefi uh, Lighthouse, S-A-I-F-E-E. -E. I will drop all the links. Uh, Mustafa, can you send me all the links in the private chat? I'll just copy paste all the links right here. Someone also asked uh, for your Twitter. So go ahead and send that. Okay, I am just typing the name of the business. I said it in the private chat. Yeah. Perfect. I'll be forwarding that. I'm not sure Polar Void where this question coming from. I'm like way behind on the chat. So if you said something while we were talking earlier, you'll have to just clarify a little. Uh... I think most of them are, but in case people aren't, let's stick to a neutral approach. Hardware emulators. No, we won't be commu uh, uh, covering uh, KMU this time, but that's a great suggestion, Polar Void. I will definitely uh, try and cover it next time. Quite honestly, I find KMU very intimidating myself, so uh, I'll have to practice a little before I do it on stream. All right, folks, we're caught up on the chart, which I'm super happy about. Uh, so, Sefi has, uh, Mustafa has sent me the link, uh, the name of the lighthouse, the business in the chat. But what I will do instead is I have all the links in my chat. So, I'll just pick them up and uh, send it. Yeah, there we have someone from England as well. That is awesome. Thank you, Matt, for clarifying. While I pull up the links, uh, for ah, Ashish, thank you so much. And the hackers, and these hackers, just the best. Love helping each other out. Yes, that's uh, the link. <laughs> you found it faster than me. Wow. <laughs> awesome. So, most of us keep an eye out if you want interns from here. Okay, these people are just amazing. All right, yes, folks. Yes, so, uh, let's dive right into the session. Uh, Mustafa, I talk a lot, so we'll be going off track enough times for us to yes, talk yes, about yes. a lot of other things. But let's get started. Mustafa, will you yes, be joining yes, us? Do you mind? Actually, you don't have a laptop. That's all right. Mustafa yeah, can make but, sure but, that I keep up with the I, chat there. But I can watch. So, yeah, that's okay. Uh, can I switch off my camera? Because. <laughs> yeah. Sure, go ahead. Go right Thank ahead. You. Thank uh, you so much, everyone. Thank you, Ritri. No. So I'll be sharing all his links. Uh, Mustafa is going to stick around. He'll probably correct me when, when, you know, every time I slip up when it comes to. Uh... Yes, I'm giving you his LinkedIn and Twitter. Let me just pull it up very quickly. And... Okay, I'm going to close my Discord in case you all have any questions. You all can always create tickets and tag me. But uh, right now I'm closing it very quickly. And we're looking for... All right, so this is Mustafa's LinkedIn, folks. And I'm pulling up his Twitter in just a second. Hello. Uh, just in case, guys, if you're sending me a request, please write something in the message so that I know that because uh, I have to make sure. So please just write something like maybe from the we are from the stream yard or from the Jitri stream. Something a message would be like awesome. It will make me easier to identify you and accept the connect with you. Thank you. Awesome, great job, folks. All right, so I'll send you a lot of links. Uh, 
great let's start with our session today then all right for folks joining us for the first time like matt because i haven't seen matt before a lot of other all the other hackers i know for a fact most of them they're, they've been here before but a quick introduction about me because mustafa when you joined we just started this team is hi i'm ritsvi i've been a coach for almost a year now actually definitely a year now i did my first hackathon around the same time this year uh, this time last year and uh, i currently work as a community manager at blues wireless which is a cellular iot company and i talk about it a lot in my stream so you all will eventually know what cellular iot with me today we're going to be covering uh, hardware emulators and more than that we're going to be covering some hardware concepts that i really, that i always like to talk about uh, I'm sorry, Matt. Have you? Uh, my bad. I usually don't forget the hackers who attend my sessions, even if it's many events. All right. So welcome back in that case. And yeah. So what we will be covering today is not just emulators. Emulators. I'll walk you through tons of emulators in the beginning, which are great if you want to, you know, create a demo or you know, quickly spin up your hackathon project. But we'll eventually use Wokwe because I really want to clarify and work on some concepts like digital inputs, analog inputs, and analog outputs. And uh, today morning, we looked at a servo motor. We'll first run it virtually today. And in tomorrow's session, we'll actually run the servo motor that I have right here. All right. So uh, let's not waste any more time. Not that we have wasted any minute till now, but we know how off track I go. So let's, let's, uh, yes, Ashish will cover what are PWM pins. Today morning, I mentioned how in device, when you look at signal processing, that is DAC and ADCs, there's something called magnitude. How does, what does it mean? What do you mean by magnitude? We talk, spoke about voltages. We're going to focus on why maybe a five volt voltage uh, controller in the same ADC magnitude will give you a better, you know, sensitivity than a three volt uh, uh Microcontroller. All right. So let's get started. Why? Why are you sad? I forgot my name. Okay, you're saying. Wow, you you guys have been mean to Matt. Don't do that. I'm never forgetting Matt now. If I forget you all. Hi there, Janki. Welcome to the stream. I have definitely not seen you before. I know for a fact. But welcome to the stream. All right, folks. So let's open WokV. I'm going to share my screen now. And we will just go through the website first. Uh, and yeah, then we'll just explore together. All right. So we'll add a new component together and everything. All right. Let me just pull this up on my monitor so that I can keep a tab on the chat as well. It's okay, Matt. It, it's not worth knowing at this point. Thank you, Ashish, again for sharing this. I will also drop the link for folks joining on other platforms who cannot see this uh, link. Uh, congratulations, Ashish. Congratulations on making to the Robotics Club. For people who don't know, I was in Robocon in my first year, and that is very close to my heart. And I absolutely, you know, uh, encourage you all to go ahead, check out any robotics club or make a space that is around you. Thank you, Pula and Void, for helping Matt understand. All right, folks. So this is Wokwe. And this, uh, I like Wokwe because they have a lot of support. Uh, and it's completely open source. So they have a Discord community that I'm already on and they're super helpful there as well. And they keep adding support to boards on a very consistent basis. So they have a very nice roadmap as well. So I'm not sure if my tab changed. I'm guessing it didn't, but you can, you all can go check out the roadmap in which they have issues sorted as per the priority. All right. So you, you can see on this website uh, and on this page so that they have a lot, they have lots of examples already, you know, quick started with the code written, right? But we won't be using any of these. We'll be creating our own. All right. So, but before that, just to kind of, you know, get a hang of this entire platform, let's just go for a simple one, right? So let's go for an ESP32 plus DHT sensor. All right. We will be using an ESP32. If you all, uh, we'll start with an ESP32 if it gets a little complicated or I am not able to explain very well, which I have a feeling will happen because today morning we went over the data sheet and we realized there are tons of things when it comes to an ESP32. We'll switch to a simpler thing like an Uno and we'll start with that and then we'll come back to an ESP32 for better understanding. All right. I can see you all have an entirely separate conversation going in the chat. 
keep that up no worries uh, you all are here on a network but make sure that you all don't do stack of what's happening either all right awesome so this is uh, an amazing setup that you can see already they have the sp hundred controller they have the dht they've also gone ahead and wired it for you which is awesome so now let's look at the left side of our page so you can see there is a diagram.json this is what i really like because over here if there's something you know not uh, right over here you can come and um, do it manually which i really appreciate because i can be very impulsive when it comes to um, playing around with bios and i almost always mess up right then there's something called libraries.txt in case we end up using external libraries this is where we'll import them right and uh, this is where you can come and literally you know add more uh, libraries all right uh, great right so if you want to upload a library you click here and it gets uploaded awesome so this is our i don't know in case you all don't know uh, any Arduino file, it is a CPP file, but it is saved as a .ino because it has an entire bundle of things that it contains. So whenever you see .ino, know that it's an Arduino IDE file. All right, folks. Simple enough, right? Very simple. Now let's go over the code in front of us, right? First is a very good habit that you can see everyone should have commenting what the code is about for the reader to understand. It's always great, especially if you're doing a hackathon project and you know there's someone who's going to be judging your code. This really helps in setting the perspective, right? So this is a good habit that you all can always develop. Excuse me. And then you have a hashtag include, which is uh, your library, which we're including. Then we have the print definition. What's a pin definition? We're telling that in our entire code, the pin number 15 is going to be called the DHT pin. All right. So let's have a look here. Uh, let me try and zoom in here. Let me know, folks, if it's visible or if it's not visible. You can see that over here, D15 is the pin that we have wired to our uh, single pin and ground. So we have ground signal and then we have our vcc pin all right uh the code as well my bad you're right this is very very tiny uh, all right is this better folks ashish is this better can you confirm no ashish i can see the chat it's just that uh i was too focused here which is why i have a two screen thing so please keep the chat going i will definitely make sure i'm reading it all right thank you for confirming no that they should do not know see you do not need to know cpp for this this is embedded cpp and this is not even this is just uses syntax for CPP. This is basically Arduino and it's a very abstracted language. And while it's not the best way to get started in hardware, it's a very, you know, uh, how should I put this in a very hobby way to get started, right? Because it's simple. It's very, very intuitive. So y'all can't mess up a lot with this. It's a good way to make sure that you win when you're making a project. Uh... Thank you, everyone, for confirming that this is big enough. <laughs> Thank you, Ashish. I am getting better thanks to you all. But yeah. All right, folks. I'm guessing the code is now big enough, but I'm not happy with you all not being able to see. All right. So let's go again. So this is the hash include uh, library. This is the pin. How do we know the pin when you go into your lab? diagram you can see that your d15 pin is connected to your uh signal pin now any any module that you take up right whether it's a sensor whether it's a wi-fi module any anything that you connect to your microcontroller there are two pins that will always be there can anyone guess the two pins always Thank you, Polar Void. Thank you, Raj K19. All right, folks. Amazing. Positive and negative. Fair enough. Close enough, Yash. <laughs> yes, Ashish. Coltage and ground. 
perfect folks you all are already pros at this so any module that you connect you'll always have a vcc and ground as a good practice especially when you're connecting to modules and let's say they have their independent voltages and grounds right for example if you have let's say one module that has its own vcc and ground that you have connected you have another module that has vcc and ground connected to your laptop and let's say you're just transferring the signal it's always an amazing idea and it's always an amazing practice to connect the grounds can anyone tell why why do you bother connecting the grounds i mean they both have their power sources can't they just do their job i mean what's what's this extra need for connection hmm anyone want to take a guess if you all are doing labs in colleges especially you know if you have an ic or something your your uh, professors are always going to ask you to connect all the grounds is going to be like a black forest out there with amazing answer polar void exactly a common reference point remember even though there are two usb ports the voltage reference remember when we say 0 and 5 volt it does not mean that 0 volt is at 0 volts it can be at 1 volt and 6 volts now that is a very uh, exemplary example or right? so don't take it for the uh, don't take it as it is but basically you need to make sure that the reference voltage the ground which they call 0 is the same all right no 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 we're not trying to pass any extra current or anything what we're trying to say is uh, a lot of times all right try this actually while you're at it okay if you ever have a board and if just connect them over serial okay connect two boards over serial and don't connect their grounds they both have power source from the laptop but don't connect their grounds they will even if the board rate is same even if the power is same even if your multimeter says that they're both the 3 volts or 5 volts it will pass gibberish because their reference voltage is in the same right no no overload issue no but very good answer you all are thinking on the right uh, thing what we're trying to remove is the difference in the reference uh, voltage all right uh extra after how about we do a very quick q and a session with mustafa right at the end of the session or when he's about to leave all right until then if you have any questions regarding hardware i'm sure mustafa will be more than happy to answer this is this is this is a good incentive if this is a good enough incentive for you all to do this uh, workshop properly i am happy to use that as an incentive next time awesome right so connecting your ground is also your grounds if especially so what did we learn till now right first of all any module any sensor that you have will always have a vcc and ground if you do not have a vcc and ground obviously that means there's something wrong and you need to look at the data sheet better and you need to read it once again to understand what's happening there always be a vcc and ground if not vcc definitely a ground and if there are separate powers to two functions or two modules that you're connecting always connect the ground all right great job folks we are doing pretty well hi janki i'm so glad this is your first session this is the very beginner oriented session don't worry about it if there's something that you missed or you need the link to any of the things i've been doing feel free to ask and i'm happy to send them all your way so they're basically the same thing your vss vcc they're all going to be your uh, voltage uh, basically if your boards are 3 volts that point will give you 3 volts if your boards 5 volts uh, it will give you 5 uh, volts does that make sense absolutely so there you go this is there you can see that the pin is 15 does that make sense does that answer your question rpj so remember that you first make this connection and then you define the pin here for your board to understand it's not the other way around all right all right let's again go through the code and then we'll come back to some new answers we'll be making something from scratch entirely so we'll be covering a lot of things as we go all right that is an amazing question yash i'm so glad you asked so a dht is a sensor it's a humidity and temperature sensor there are types of dht i think there is a dht 22 apart from a dht 11 or a dht 14 i forget but uh, basically again as you go higher the line the more sophisticated the sensor gets 
So I need to have a DHT eleven running somewhere here. Uh, that, there we go. So this is a DHT sensor right here, and you can see over here that there is a lot of specifications given already. So the specifications is how you connect to. Uh, the board and you make sure that the specifications match you do not want to connect a five volt pin to a three volt sensor <laughs> that's sad ashish i'm so sorry but there's a lot you can do with temperature sensors temperature sensor dashboards and uh da you know data visualizations are some of the most common things that you would see in iot and in iot projects so great yeah should i answer your question though when it when you ask what's a dht Oh, there we go. This is a DHT22. So there's a DHT11 that is more commonly used. It's a slightly cheaper one. What's a pin? That's an amazing question again. So a pin is any, you see these dots right here? Uh, okay. You see these dots right here? These are all pins. So uh, let me quickly pull up a board and show it to you. Aha, uh -huh, there you go. So uh, these things that you see, these are pins and what we're trying to do is we're trying to kind of map out these pins. So all these pins have functions that they are already labeled here and based on the labels, uh, you make the connections. Cell Proster, feel free to ask whatever questions you have. Uh, I'm making a lot of assumptions and I'll be very happy to, you know, get rid of those assumptions as I go. I totally relate with you, Polaroid, uh, Polar Void. I, uh, I've actually properly burnt uh, DHT sensors. So if you all see uh, another very common mistake people make, I have made as you start out is connecting ground to VCC and VCC to ground. It heats up like crazy. And by the time you realize what's happening, the sensor is usually gone. Because these are very cheap and you know, basic sensors, they don't have a lot of protection, uh, protection in terms of uh, the socket. This, however, is a DHT uh, 11 module. It's a module. I'm just trying to figure out if it's a DHT 11 or a 22. Uh, it's a DHT 11. Or it's a DHT, it's a DHT 11 and it's a module. So if you all see, apart from the temp, uh, sensor, there is a tiny circuit here. This circuit is basically nothing but a diode. And what does a diode do? A diode does not let the current flow backwards. Right? It will heat up. The diode might break, but it won't let the current flow backwards. So the... It's not entirely proof, but until the diode can hold up, the circuit is uh, safe. All right. All right. Let's go back and let's look in some questions. Awesome. Exactly. They're just reference. This is just a random sensor taken here to, you know, make understand how you can connect it and how a code you uh, code, you know, comes across for a sensor that you take randomly. Uh, temperature sensors again, because they don't vary a lot, they're a good way to start. That way, it's a lot easier to debug. No, Raj, absolutely not. You don't. It does not have to be fifteen for that matter. That is a very good question. Let me try and just change it here. But whenever you do look at the pins, this is where the data sheet comes in handy. So when we try and connect the server, we look at which pin works, but that's okay. So I'm just going to delete this. And what we can do is we can quickly connect this to D4. What I will do here, though, is change this to D4. Right? Uh, not 43, 4. All right. Does that make sense, folks? Any digital pins. D stands for digital. All right? Mm. No, that's the reason hardware is fun, Yash. You can, you can, you know, create so much art material by just burning stuff. I really don't think you should, even if you can. All right, folks, let's move on. I am, I am a little concerned about the enthusiasm and which direction the enthusiasm is headed, but enthusiasm it is. So I'll take what I'm getting. All right. All right, folks, let's move on. All right. So we first looked at the pin that is your DHT pin. What this means is we're telling that our DHT signal is connected at, on pin number four. All right. What we're doing here, right? So in the morning, I mentioned, in case you all missed it, I'm mentioning it again. And please feel free to ask questions. Uh, 
about it. That is a great point, Polar Void. It's something so real, you know. There's nothing abstract about hardware. Amazing question, RPJ. Please remind me again. I want to cover bond rate very properly because bond rate can be a tad bit confusing. All right, I'm actually going to open a web page, show you how the formula works and everything. Uh... All right, I'm glad, Lord, some of that's happening for you. And I hope we don't make you lose your interest anytime soon. All right, so today morning, I mentioned that when you run a code, so we were talking about difference between an RTOS and a GPOS, right? A GPOS is general purposing operating system and an RTOS is a real-time operating system. So uh, we were talking about why real-time system, real-time operating system exists. RBG just, you know, went... GPOS is so much better. Why bother with RTOS? And that's an amazing question, right? I mean, it is better. Why not just make microcontrollers more robust, you know, put a GPOS on it? Well, because we have a lot of power optimization and sometimes a lot of actions just need to be repeated, right? There's no point of your washing machine having a GPOS and a very fancy screen and you ping like way over the top for something that is absolutely unnecessary, right? Your washing machine has a 20 minute cycle, one hour cycle, it has to do the same thing over and over again. It has a few sensors in place to kind of check that it's happening properly. But apart from that, there's really no need to have a GPOS, right? It does not need a very dynamic memory. In that case, an RTOS is really handy because you have a tiny microcontroller. It's supposed to do some bare minimum work. It's supposed to do the work over and over again and maybe be a little robust to tolerate faults, right? So when you have an RTOS, everything is timed, right? You can see if whenever you see something based on time, that is asking it to either even wait for a few seconds, that means it's an RTOS. It's a time-based system, right? So now if you are going to argue that a Python script also has to be, I agree, but that script is basically what an RTOS is doing, right? So it's basically what you run on your Raspberry Pi. Uh, but apart from that, the entire system is a GPOS, all right? So an RTOS has a time-based thing. Now, every time you turn it on, we know that the entire code is going to run over and over again. But before that code goes into that loop, that while one loop, or in terms of Arduino, the void loop, which is basically, there is a setup phase, right? These are some settings that you don't want to keep changing. These are set once and based on them, the entire loop operates. So that is what a void setup is. Over here, you're going to, you know, make sure that the sensor is initialized. In the setup, you're going to check whether or not the sensor is connected, whether you're getting the right signal and things like that. All right. I haven't paid attention to the chat in a bit. So in case I missed something, let me know. Hmm. Okay. Oh, you can definitely use the pin number again and again. This is just because this is good coding, right? Because every time instead of me, so everywhere the HD pin is used, I can very simply just put, you know, four. That's good enough. Right? Wherever it's used. And you're right. Right now it's only being used once. But when you're using LEDs, when you have multiple, you know, if you have two modules of the same kind, having a good name, having a constant name is always helpful because a four can be changed later on as well, right? But uh, a constant variable won't be changed. And it's a lot easier. The code becomes much easier, right? Because if this didn't exist, right? Let's say this wasn't there and there's just a DHT dot, DHT center, DHT sensor dot set up for and so and so forth. You wouldn't know what's happening. What is that for? Until, you know, you actually went around, played and saw that there's a pin connected. Or better, if you were smart enough and you went ahead and read the data sheet or the library reference, right? So this is just good coding, all right? And let's stick to it. Yeah, it's a good practice and there's, there's no point in not following it. Thank you, Clogology. I think, uh, yes, YouTube tutorials are... There's some amazing driver tutorials. I'll also check this link out later, but yep. Very good question, Ashish. We'll cover the crystal clock today if we come across it in the data sheet. Otherwise, uh, yes, the crystal oscillator, right? It's supposed to help with the time also. <laughs> Not a good solution, but I understand why you would do that. I love the enthusiasm. I like how we're still on defining pins in Arduino and y'all are already talking about writing assembly code. Great job, folks. I love the enthusiasm. 
well, best of luck, self trusted. If you all, if you have any tips for the folks here trying to learn assembly language and hardware, go ahead and shoot them right in the chat. What do you mean by card RPG? I don't understand. I lost track of how card came into the picture. I'm going to wait for RPG to clarify the question as in what do you mean by card? And if you mean the microcontroller, uh, uh, yes, you can use other microcontrollers as well. The code more or less remains the same. Here's a fun fact for you all. Every time you all are using a RPOS system or Arduino, 80% of the code is always the same for all the hardware. It's the 20% that actually changes based on the architecture, based on the configuration and things like that. <laughs> Matt, most of my streams are this this uh, chaotic, but that's that's the part I really like about them. So, yes, RPG, you can have another chipset. We're using ESP32. Let's have a look at the different boards available. Ah, uh, let's see. Uh, I'll, I'll show you in a bit. There are multiple other boards available, like Arduino and ESP8266. So yeah, you can change the board. The basic code for DHT11 will remain the same because DHT11 over here is not neither using Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, or anything. It's using a simple. I'm going to leave the digital stash analog part for you all to decide in a bit. But uh, it's using one pin, one signal pin, VCC and ground, and most microcontrollers have that, right? So. Uh, you can use a lot of microcontrollers with this sensor without a lot of thought. Wow, Matt, I'm impressed. You definitely deserve a break. Take one whenever you need it, all right? All right, bye, Polar Void. I'll see you tomorrow, hopefully, in the session. Great question, RPG. So DHT11 and DHT22 are basically both uh, temperature and humidity sensors. If you open up the data sheets, which I absolutely encourage you all to do whenever I take a new name of a component, I am happy to explain it. Ask me anyway for the sake of testing my memory, but uh, definitely Google it yourself and add the word data sheet. It will show you everything there is to know about that module, including the sensitivity and the ranges. And the major thing that changes between a DHT11 and a DHT22 is the range and the sensitivity of the sensor. Awesome. There's a lot of advice being given amongst hackers, and that is amazing and very lovely to see. All right. So folks, we're almost through with us short code we are going through and uh, let's look at the different things all right so we now we know that setup is going to run once every time you hit the reset button on your controller the setup is going to run once and then it will move on to your uh, loop which is going to keep running your loop is basically a while run all right and uh, let's look at what the loop is doing okay so every time the loop is running there is something called the temp and humidity data all right this data is basically getting DHT sensor, which is your uh, object over here. And we're getting uh, the get temperature and humidity uh, part of the object. And it is saving in the data variable. All right. Now, this uh, variable is then being printed. So what we're doing is serial.print line. The line automatically adds a new line character. And uh, this will print temperature plus the string which we're getting from the object it will add rather concatenate the degree hashes and over here the same thing's happening for humidity then we're printing this for the sake of you know making our printout look neat and then we're asking it to wait for one second uh, the delay by default is in milliseconds so when we say thousand milliseconds we're asking it to wait for one second now let's try and run this code and see if it works because we did change the uh, pin number and I do I have not verified with the pin number if it works. So we're getting none, which is weird, which is not something what we're supposed to get. All right, let's try changing the pin back to 15. Uh, Oh, 
it tight. Let's run it again. And there we go. So now we know that the pin 4 cannot tolerate uh, analog or digital signal. We'll see which one is the correct one in a bit. But you can see now, now it's giving you answers. That means this is working and earlier it wasn't working. All right, folks, does this make sense? Did this code make sense? Is there anything in this code except for serial.begin? I understand I haven't explained this yet, but apart from that, that does not make sense. For the time being, can you all just remember that this is the baud rate? Okay, this is the speed at which it's transmitting the data. All right. Let's see. Exactly, we're trying to sense temperature and humidity. Thank you, Ashish. Thank you so much, Lord, sir, for dropping this. Uh, yes, this is the data sheet for DHT uh, sensor, and I'm pretty sure it must cover most of the... Exactly, this is a great way to go. Speed transfer rate in bits, right? That's your baud rate. Uh, changing this basically changes... So this baud rate is not, is not the communication speed at which your data is being received it's rather the rate at which it's communicating uh with your other with your controller cdd so let's let's take an example right one there is frequency of data all right so frequency of data is you know me giving you five numbers in one second now the baud rate will decide the speed at which i tell you that each number right for example, let's say I am telling one of y'all, you know, I'm telling y'all uh, what we're going to be doing today. It's a repeat. It's a void loop code, right? Every one second, I'm telling you what we're doing. Right? Okay. We're doing a hardware session. We're doing a hardware session, right? So the frequency of the data is one second. But how fast I tell it to you is, is what the body does. So we're doing a hardware session or we are doing a hardware session. That's the speed at which I'm giving you that information. The frequency of the information remains one second, but how fast we are communicating is the baud rate. Does that make sense? I know it might not be a very obvious an analogy, but let me know if that makes sense. So frequency is there that you can always define, but the baud rate is the speed at which, and you need to make sure that it always matches. For example, if you go in Arduino, you will see that there is something called the serial uh, monitor or the serial rate. If the serial monitor rate does not match the rate at which you're printing, there'll be gibberish because even though the frequency might match and then it, it knows it's getting something, but it won't understand uh, what's happening. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Bought it and frequency are two pretty different things, right? Like I said, frequency is the data at which uh, the rate at which you're receiving the data. Baud rate is how fast that data is reaching you, right? Oh, there's a new hacker there. Hi there. I'm trying to pronounce your username, and I would really appreciate it being a little simpler. But if you just could tell me your name, I'll, I'll be happy to remember that. Does that make sense, Ashish, though? Right? So I'm telling you the same information every second. So information, information, information. That's the frequency, right? That's one hertz, one time per second. But how fast I tell you, right? Whether I say information in the entire one second or I take 0.1 second to say the word information is the baud rate. And we both need to be on the same baud rate to be able to understand that. The frequency is going to remain the same. That is one hertz. I understand. When you start looking at the formula, it might make a little more sense. All right. Awesome, folks. We are almost there. Now we're going to be starting our own code, uh, starting our entire thing by ourselves. So that should be fun. And it will be a tad bit more time taking. So, uh... yes, that's because our baud rates aren't matching, Yash, because I'm going too fast with the information. The frequency might be right for you, but I'm actually going very fast. Ah, that's all right. You'll get there. So Yash, everyone here is in high school and he's already way ahead. And I'm very proud of the fact that he's still trying to understand this. So way to go, Yash. Because there's really no point in making the baud rate maximum, right? It's about your microcontroller communicating with your sensor. A lot of time, our sensors aren't, uh, they have a very specific number of baud rates at which you can work them. I do not remember which one, but there's a specific I2C based controller, which only works at 4800. I think it's the RFC module. 
one of the modules okay and it just works at 4800 so your entire code needs to be brought down to 4800 now all the other sensors need to work at 4800 a lot of time when you're using an lcd right there the board rate really makes a difference because you're literally programming and controlling every pixel with the driver oh rpj you're in high school too well i am super proud of y'all working so hard at like 11 30 in the night way to go folks i'm super super glad to have you all here i'm so glad you've used i2c so i2c spi whenever i say these words these are basically different serial protocols right so uh, just a quick quick update on what's a serial protocol right so whenever you connect your uh, sensor or your module to your microcontroller there are multiple ways for it to function right sometimes the data is fairly complicated right there is acceleration data how does your controller know what data it's getting so what we do is for there to be consistency in the data we add a clock signal and this clock signal helps us to make sure that the data that we're getting is consistent so then we have something called the I2C protocol, and then we have something called the SPI protocol. And then there's something called the serial protocol, which is the most basic protocol that that's how it started. If there, there is no, there is no check for whether or not you receive the data. There's Alex, there's TX, there's data going all over the place. And it's one of the easiest protocols to start with. Whenever you start a new system, always test it with a UART protocol. It's just data going over the wire. It's the easiest to understand about how the system works. All right. Exactly. Communication protocols. And they're usually called serial protocols. All right. I'm so glad you like the energy, Janki. Uh, all right, folks. Uh, if, if I hope you all have kept up till here. I'm going to share the Wokvi link again. And this time, we're going to be creating a new project altogether. All right. Uh, I think you all will have to sign in to create a new project or something like that. Uh, you can see I've already signed in. So I'm just going to go to my project. I'm going to be okay with leaving the page. All right, I'm going to create a new project. Now you can see these are the different uh, boards available. So I'm going to go with an Arduino Uno for the sake of simplicity. All right, once I'm here, uh, I'm going to click on the plus sign. I'm going to add a servo once I find it. All right. We're going to have a servo. And what we're going to have is a variable resistor. Or it's also called a potentiometer, which I just knew existed a bit. Oh, there we go. There we go. Right. So we have the potentiometer. All right. There's something also called the slide potentiometer, which is basically a sliding potentiometer. You know what? Let's. I don't know how to wire this, quite honestly. So let's see. Oh, signal. Ground. VCC. Okay. You know what? Let's use a sliding potentiometer. And uh, we'll wire it to the same uh, signal so that we understand what's going on. So I understand what's happening. All right, folks. Uh, if I'm going to give you all a second to get your components on the screen. To go over all the components again, we have something called the Arduino Uno. We have a servo motor, we have a sliding potentiometer, and then we have a normal potentiometer, right? That's sad, Ashish. I'm sorry to hear that, but you're doing well. You're in the robotics team. You're going to know more in a very short time anyway. Yes, potentiometer exactly from the physics lab. Basically, a uh, variable uh, potentiometer. All right, so Mustafa has to go. Mustafa, do you want to say maybe a few words before you leave? If you all have a quick questions for Mustafa very quickly, you all can put them in the chat before we continue. Uh, yes. Uh, hi, everyone. So I have to leave. I have to go somewhere in the morning. Uh, I'm a morning person a lot. So yeah, anyone has any questions, hit the chat. I'll answer. Hey, yeah, thank you. Thank you. All right. Mustafa, thank you so much for joining in. I'm probably going to have Mustafa soon for the next GHW2. So you'll probably see him around a lot. Yes. Thanks, yes. Thank you so much, Ritri. So much for joining.
Thank you for my team. Thank you. See you. Bye. folks so let's continue i'm so glad you all were so nice to mustafa hi ankit welcome back how to create this project that's a great question uh self roster so what i did was first i went to walk me the link to which i have shared before let me share the link again with you all very quickly you will probably have to log in all right so let's see you log in once you log in you can click on your profile picture go to projects as soon as you go to projects you can let me just show that to you again i'll just share the entire window stop screen share screen share screen window there we go all right so when you click on your projects you can click on that new project right here and you can select i have selected uno once you select uno and you come here you can click on the add button here it's a very pretty purple according to me and you all can add uh, a servo and you all can also add a potentiometer and a slide potentiometer or just one of them however you all are comfortable and you know what go ahead and add an led as well because we'll start with an led first and then we'll go on to a servo plus i'm realizing we might need another hmm library for server but that's okay uh, i just want to see if there's a server library already there ah there is a server plus knob example so we'll just use this later but we'll first start with an led and then we'll go with that all right I am sorry, folks. I lost track of the chat for just a second. Okay. Awesome self roster. So once you've logged in, you go to your profile picture right here, and you click on new projects or my projects right here. Yes, this website is mostly free for all the hardware that we see right now. I know Ahish, it's okay. It's a little late, but I'm glad you all stuck around for so long. Perfect, Zell Frost. I'm glad you've uh, caught up. Ouch! You all have some very uh, big horror stories uh, from uh, your school labs. Yeah, I, there was the point I was proud of that. At this point, I sleep early, I wake up late, I'm just trying to get my schedule right. If you all have any tips on how to get that, I am happy to listen. Okay, folks, I'm going to just take a quick five-minute break and get myself some water because I'm realizing I've been literally screaming at the screen. So I'm going to take a very quick five-minute break. Until then, just make sure that you all are on the screen. A quick a quick uh, thing that you need on the screen is an Arduino Uno, a Sovo motor, an LED, uh, a sliding potentiometer, and a normal potentiometer. All right, I'll be back in just uh, five minutes. I will answer this question as soon as I come as soon as I come back. All right, I'll keep the chat rolling. I will catch up. The last question I answered was, "Oh, Lord Sub is going. Bye, Lord Sub. I'll hopefully see you tomorrow in the morning stream." Uh, all right. I think I've kept up with the chat till now. I'll quickly come back and answer until then you all come to this screen and if you all want to play around with the connections go ahead all right we'll be understanding the difference between digital and analog in just two minutes and awesome
Wow, 17 chat messages. Y'all have been active. All right, I'm so sorry to see you go. Yeah, sure, ready. Uh, I'll see you tomorrow, hopefully. Uh, hmm. RPJ, uh, if I understand it's very late, but I'll try and cover it as much as I can in the next 20 minutes. All right, that way y'all can leave. Uh, I know it's super late. Let's just look at the connections. What I will do is, in case it's getting late, instead of y'all sticking around till late, I'll slow down, cover everything properly, and y'all can watch the recording later. Does that make more sense? Would y'all like that, or would y'all like me to rush through right now? And then we can cover it again tomorrow. Uh, I know, right, Selfroster? They have some very scary stories from their lab. Thank you, San Diego. Thank you, Ashish. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's let's take everyone into consideration. All right. So let's rush through very quickly for the next 10 minutes. And then whoever needs to go can go. Then I'll whoever wants to stick around and understand what's really happening or missed out on whatever is happening, we can cover it. All right. Late night snackers here. Well, I, I have a coffee here. So probably not a very good habit to show off. But <laughs> all right, let's get back. I know a few people uh, need to go back to sleep. I know it's very late. So let's let's quickly jump into our uh, code. Okay. So let's forget our server for a bit. All right. Let's focus on these three components. Okay. So these two are potentiometers. Potentiometer is a tad bit fancy name. What we really mean by a potentiometer is a variable resistor. What would a variable, variable resistor mean? Basically, you can vary its resistance from very low to very high. So you know how you have LDRs. In case you have not heard of LDRs before, LDR basically means light-dependent resistor. All right. So what happens is, based on the amount of light on the resistor or the LDR, the resistance of it changes. And when the resistance changes, you can actually measure its resistance and tell the threshold of whether or not there's enough light. All right. So Something similar is what a potentiometer, but instead of its resistance automatically varying, here there is usually a knob or a slider, right? So one of the simplest examples is your fan uh, speed regulator. It's basically doing the same thing. Or uh, your brightness, your torch brightness, they're all basically PWMs or basically resistance controlled light, right? Oh, sorry to see you grow, go, Janki. I hope you can catch up with the recording data or I'll see you tomorrow morning in the morning session. All right. Exactly. Ashish remembers his grade 12, whatever. So, yes, this is what the traditional potentiometer used to be based on. But the current potentiometers are tiny. I have potentiometers uh, but i'll show them to you tomorrow morning in the session because i know for a fact if i try to take out one thing i'm gonna mm, crash my entire uh, drawer there so i'm gonna make sure i'm a little more organized tomorrow and all right so uh let's get back right so uh we have a slider potential and we have our normal potentiometer. Usually have those, uh, it's called a pot, a trim pot, if you ever hear a designer saying basically it's a potentiometer, all right? So let's look at all the connections available here. We have the ground and we have our VCC that we already covered, right? We've already covered. Any, any module has a VCC and a ground. Uh, then we have our signal. Basically, that's your resistance. That is the point of resistance, okay? So let's make the connections, shall we? So we have our Arduino right here, nice and zoomed in. Let's take this here. Again, nice. When you click on the question mark, it also takes you to its entire data sheet and the entire API reference. Very cool, right? All right. So let's let's click on VCC. And now, which one do you think I should connect it to? There is a 3 volt and then there is the 5 volt. Let me connect it to V in for the time being. And what I'm also going to do is I'm going to search for the purple dot and get it a little neater so that it's easier for us to visualize, right? 
so there we go all right and you know what i'm actually also going to change it from here to ground okay next let's put our ground right so our ground goes to the not 3.3 volt not the 5 volt we want it to be uh, there we go ground right so there we go this is our ground and let's do the same thing over again let's get the purple dot and let's make it a tad bit neater <sighs> what did i just do uh, let's go ground ground so if you see it's also highlighting the pins where you can put it okay when you click on it there will be a purple dot and you can move the purple dot to make it a little neater all right so you have your uh that is a very good question, Ashish. We'll see how it works. All right. So we have our VCC and ground connected. All right. Let's hold off on the single pin. All right. Let's go to our slider potentiometer and connect it. Connect its VCC and ground as well. So let's zoom in again. We have something called the VCC. We'll take it to V in, or rather, never mind. That's the wrong pin. Delete. We're going to start over so we can see this is the 3.3, this is the 5 volt. Let's connect it to 5 volts. Let's delete this as well for that matter and let's connect it to the other one that is 3 volts. Okay, so we have one connected to 5 volts. Right, and one connected to three volts. Next, let's connect its ground. So let's take the ground, bring it to ground two. All right. So here's a quick trick: if uh, you run out of VCCs and grounds on your uh, board, if you run out of VCCs, what you can always do is pull the pin high, and if you run out of grounds, you can always pin the pull the pin low. We'll understand what does pulling mean in just two minutes. All right. So, okay, we're done with our BCC and ground connections. Let's connect our LED. So, folks, where do you think I should connect my LED? Okay, so you can see that there are a lot of options here. You can see that there is a wave line here to some of the uh, pins. Where should I connect my LED? Hmm. Any any suggestions? No suggestions. No one wants to randomly. That is a good way to get started. But uh, okay, so we know that the negative will go to the negative, the cathode. So. The cathode is the, folks, cathode is the, no one? <laughs> smart, very smart. I see two answers. One says minus, one says plus. Great job. <laughs> Amazing answers, folks. Long one. Great job. I have equal numbers of opposite answer. <laughs> Great job. I think this is where the fundamental is really sure. I'm so glad this person, I forgot my name here, is giving an explanation that, okay, I know what I'm talking about. All right. Let's look up an LED's data sheet because it seems like that's what we have to do for everyone to have a clear understanding, right? So let's look at an LED data sheet. Anytime that you all are not sure, right? A lot of times these simple things always uh, 
cause a problem. Also, quick update, folks. The check-in link has been fixed. Uh, kudos to Mary, who has done it so quickly, given how swamped she is. But I'm sending the link to you all in the chat again. All right. Uh, while you all can check register and check in again, let's look at a quick uh, standard LED data sheet. And we'll see what the anode and cathode is. So it's okay, you know, these are some tiny things that people always get confused about, which is perfectly fine. But instead of, you know, jumping to conclusions or trying it out randomly, please do not do that with hardware. This is your go-to thing. Type that module and type data sheet with it. And uh, <laughs> I like... <laughs> I like the amount of effort being put into trying to, you know, remember it. But that's okay. That's the best part about having uh, a data sheet, right? Okay. So we know that the longer part of an LED is the positive part and the next smaller part is the negative part. Another very quick way to look at it is if you have an LED, there is a small cut towards the anode. All right, so if you ever pick up an LED and look at it, even if the stems are cut, you can always look at the where the small cut is and you'll know where the anode is. All right, so over here you can see there is one is cathode, which is this is uh, anode and this is cathode. So anode is your positive one and cathode is your negative one. Simple, simple. Don't have to remember any stupid logic. <laughs> So with everyone being so nice and giving such great answers and the long one, such, such amazing answers I've received today on what's uh, anode and cathode, it's great to see. All right, but just so that we're clear and on the same page, one, the longer one is the positive one, it's the anode, and the smaller negative one is the cathode. Fair point, folks. All right, let's go back to our project and now connect the LED. So now we know that the anode is the positive one. So this is the cathode and this is the negative one. So the negative one always goes to your ground. All right, so we can, can we connect to the ground? We're connecting it to the ground. All right, then we have the cathode or rather the anode, which is the positive one. So now the question remains the same. Where do I put it? So you see these baby pins? I'm going to put it at one of the baby pins. We'll see why. All right. So let's take anode. Let's connect it to 10. Because the 10 has the baby thing. All right, the baby uh, label. Uh, let's flip this while we can. There you go. This looks much neater. All right. So we have our LED connected. Now, let's connect our potentiometer. All right. So what we'll do is, uh, first, we can either connect the potentiometer directly to the LED. But instead of that, we'll connect it to a signal pin. And we'll read the signal pin. And then we will uh, map it to our LED. All right. So what we're trying to do here is basically control the brightness of the LED. All right. So let's connect the signal pin to one of the analog pins. All right. So A1 and let's connect this one to A2. All right. Awesome. We're doing really well on time over here. All right. So now let's go to our code. Okay. So just let's quickly go over what we have done here. Right, so we have our ground connected. We have our LED connected to a PWM pin. All right, then we have our uh, signal of the potentiometers, which is basically our resistance, connected to our analog pins, and uh, the output of the LED is connected to a PWM pin. All right, so we'll we'll look into all of these terms as we go. Right, so let's first start by writing our code. So we know that the code, let's quickly comment and add the code that we've written. So we know that A1 goes to potentiometer signal. We know A2 goes to the slider potential meter signal. 
All right. Then we have our pin number 10 connected to LED output. All right, folks, does this make sense till here? Is it all obvious? Is there any questions at this point that I can help with? All right, and all our grounds are connected, right? All our grounds are connected. Is it? Awesome, no questions. I'm so glad to hear that. All right. So let's see what we get, all right? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna start very simple, all right? So we're gonna go into our void setup. We're gonna first add the serial.begin, right? Serial.begin. And because we're doing something slightly simpler, let's keep it a little slower, right? So let's keep it at 9600. It doesn't make a difference again. It's not, it's not gonna change the frequency of our data, right? Sure, we can give it 115200 as well. It's just a nostalgia thing for me because I always start smaller projects in 9600. But all right, let's keep it at 115200. Okay. We do not need to analyze, uh, initialize anything here. All right. Next, what we're going to do is we're just going to simply read the pin. Okay. So there's something called analog read, digital read, digital output, and analog output, or rather analog write and digital write. All right, so I'm gonna just read and print what we're getting. All right, so we're gonna go here and we're gonna go do a digital read. All right, so which pin are we digital reading? We're not actually digital reading anything. Let's do this. We're gonna do an analog read. All right, we'll understand the difference between all of these things. Uh, A0, oh sorry, A1 and A2, right? Let's just quickly check. A1 and A2. So we're going to read A1, right? And let's put it in a variable, right? So it's an analog. Uh, so let's do a float. A equal to analog read A1. So let's just make this A1 as well, right? Ah, wrong spelling. Right? Let's do the same thing for A2. All right, so we have two analog reads. Now let's do another thing, right? Kind of, you're kind of on the say, uh, right track, Ashish, but, uh, oh, you need me to zoom again? My bad, folks. I completely forgot that I opened a new project. And there you go. Is this better? Let me know if this is not okay. I'll just remove myself from like my picture from the stream and you should be able to see it rather clearly. Or you know what? Let's just do this. Slightly better, hopefully. All right. Great. See? So now we're going to do... Now let's do this. Let's copy it. And do float D1, D2. And let's make this digital read. And we'll see the difference, all right, as to why bother with the differences. And once we see what's happening differently, we can try and draw some conclusions as to what we can do differently. Now, we're just reading this, right, to make sure uh, we can see what's happening. We will also print it, right? Basically, you're getting very close to the answer, Ashish. All right, so let's do a serial print. So we're going to do a serial dot line we're gonna do and log one is equal to plus a one plus just a full stop for the sake of neatness but right, then we're gonna do a copy paste copy paste and log read two is equal to a2 all right so this is fairly nice then we're going to copy paste these two right here she's giving away so many hints okay so we're going to do a uh, digital read one we're going to go for d1 
Now understand that I've taken the same uh, data type for both of for all the variables. So if the value is different, there is really not it's really not the fault of uh, the variable, right? We're, it's the difference between reading that will make a difference. All right. So let's do a quick play. Let's, do, let's see what happens. Okay. It's saying uh, invalid. Oh, my bad, folks. Close. My, my bad, my bad. I'm pretty sure this is how you can concatenate it. Let me quickly look it up. Hmm. Hmm. Weird. This is how concatenation works. I don't know why it isn't working. Let me quickly just pull up the concatenation. Ah, my bad, folks. We need to add a float here in case you all suggested that earlier. Uh, correct. So this is. Thank you, Ashish. Correct suggestion. So we're going to convert this into a string. We're going to do a one. Remove this all together. Let's do a string. There we go. Let's just copy this. All right. This should ideally run. Let's see if we get any more errors. Oh, my bad. Again. Sting. Sting. And this should ideally work. All right. Now you can see this thing's gone fairly crazy. So let's add some delay here. So let's add a delay of just half a second, right? So like 500 should be good enough. There we go. All right. So now it's zero because our potentiometer and everything is at the same state. Let's try and change it. All right. So let's see if this changes. You can see only one digit is changing, right? And that's the analog read, right? Let's move it all the way across to one, zero, two, three. And again, only one value is changing. That is an analog read one. Let's go to our slider potentiometer here. And you can see only analog read value is changing. And now we can see that it's the maximum is 1023. Why do you think this is happening? Why is the digital read not giving you an answer? You know what? Let's make your life a little more easier or difficult based on what we're doing. And let's take another signal and let's connect it to a digital pin, right? Random two digital pins, OK? So it's a digital pin 4. And we're going to do a digital read on pin number 4482. There you go. We're going to do pin number four. All right. So let's see what happens when this when we do this. And we're going to actually add make this four as well. All right. So our signal pin is going there. Let's run this. And we still see that only analog read is getting value and not the digital pin, even though we've now connected and we're reading digital pin rather the analog pin. Why do you think this is happening? Anyone?
anyone want to take a guess as to what's happening so let's stop this and let's go and open a quick jamboard all right and let me quickly draw it and show it to you how it works ah lots of lots of scribbling lots of hardware explanations and let's open a new There we go. So that's a new uh, Jamboard. So let's understand why this is happening, right? Let me quickly connect my hardware. All right. So let's understand what's happening here, right? So we have something called. Uh, Okay, where are we? Okay, we have something called the analog pin. Okay, A0, A1. All right, then we have something called the D1 and something called the D2. All right, then we also have something called the PWM pin, right, which we have connected at the pin number 10. All right, so what's the difference between these things? Okay. So analog pin is something that can differentiate between different values. So what's the basic difference between digital and analog, right? So analog, you have a something called the sine wave, right? You can always imagine it as a wave, correct? There's something called a wave. Digital is something that has zero and one, zero and one. Basically, your digital pin or your digital anything has only two states. It can either detect a one or a zero. When you talk about it in terms of voltages, it can, if you're, let's say you're giving it five volts, if you ever take a DMM and measure, right, you will see that it will, let's say if it's a three volt board, right? So if it's a three volt board divided by two, what will it be? 1.5. So you're going to get 1.5. That is your threshold value. Anything above 1.5 voltage will be considered as 1. Anything below 1.5 voltage will be considered as 0. So if you give it an analog input, it will only still detect two states. All right. And that's an amazing animation, Ashish. All right. Great job. <laughs> but that's what digital is doing. Analog, on the other hand, right? It's going to be able to detect continuous values, which is why every time you connect a potentiometer or anything that has multiple input values, you will always connect it to the analog pin. All right. So over here, you can see that we're getting values from 0 to 1, 0, 2, 3, which is basically 1, 0, 2, 4 values, right? So if you count the number of digits from 0 to 1, 0, 2, 3, you have 1, 0, 2, 4 values. And can anyone tell me the significance of this number? It's 2 to the power 10. Basically, this is a 10-bit magnitude. Exactly. It's a 10-bit magnitude. Basically, a 10-bit A, B, C. Analog to digital converter. All right. Now, there's something called PWM. What is PWM? Now, remember, digital input and output are the same, right? You can either give it zero. So if there is a digital pin and you give it analog input, it's going to detect two states. Anything above the half of the voltage value will be one. Anything below it will be considered zero. If it's giving, if you try and make it give analog output, what will it do? If you have something called an analog output, if you're trying to, you know, tell it to give values from 0 to 255, it will do the same thing, right? It will take 255. It will divide it by 2. Any numbers that you give above the by 2 value, it will give output 1. Anything below it, it will give output 0. And there's a very high chance it will also error in the process of doing so, right? PWM helps you give an analog output, right? This is the DAC, right? 
so what what happens here is basically you get values in a sine wave and usually the values that you get in arduino specifically range from 0 to 256 can any so to sorry 255 can anyone tell me the significance of this digit 256 yes what's the exactly it's 2 to the power 8 great job ashish which basically means it's an 8 bit magnitude Okay, this is where the word magnitude comes in. Why magnitude though? Why bother with magnitude in the first place? It's because the more numbers you have, the more sensitive your value can be. Now imagine for smaller values, right? Let's say your temperature, for example. The worst case, it varies between 28 degree and 30 degree Celsius. You'll still get a fairly accurate value. But if your temperature needs to be you know, measured down to the, you know, third decimal or fourth decimal, you want a bigger range for to be able to tell that, okay, this is the change between the two digits. And, excuse me, and for that, the bigger the magnitude, the bigger the change you can, uh, the smaller the change you can measure. Does that make sense? So, let Sorry, folks, I kicked myself out of the stream. Let me share my screen again very quickly. All right. Uh, <laughs> yes, I literally kicked myself out right now. But you all get the point, right? So bigger the numbers you have, which is why. So because you have only 256 the numbers, it becomes an 8-bit magnitude. When you have 1024 numbers, it becomes a 10-bit magnitude. So that is your basic significance of your magnitude, PWM pins, and uh, your digital pins, right? Also, folks, I am realizing that in nine minutes exactly, the next session is going to start. So we will continue this in tomorrow's session. What I would like you all to do over here is we have successfully connected our potentiometers, which is awesome. Uh, you got an error? Did you get an error? I forgot my name. In case you all are getting errors or you all can't figure this out, we will continue this entire thing tomorrow. So save this if you can. All right. Or we'll start from scratch in case you all missed it. But we now today understood the significance of the analog pin, the digital pin, and the PWM pin. All right. So these wavy pins, remember I asked you why do they have this wave? It's because these pins are capable of giving a PWM output. That is, they can actually give out an analog value between 0 to 255. Now, does it really give a number? When you say 255, does it really give a number? We'll see that tomorrow. All right. So, folks, I'm going to close the session right now so that you all get a good break before the next session. The next session is Definity. And I know a lot of you all have already attended my Definity session, but Ethan's going to take it and you all can clarify some doubts with Ethan in the next session. All right. Uh, are there any questions at this uh, point? Oh, you were talking about that. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, that was very stupid. <laughs> but, well, I love the energy for closing the session. <laughs> yes, we will continue this tomorrow morning. Ashish, you concentrate on your exam. Best of luck for it. And uh, I'll see you tomorrow. We'll continue this and then we'll get started on the data visualization part of our IoT. All right, and we'll also be using something called the soft card tomorrow, and that should be fairly fun. <laughs> yes, we're also having cups stacking tomorrow morning. I keep forgetting about that. I'm glad you could make it for today's session, Ashish. Best of luck. Santiago, did you ask the question, okay, where the four pin connect? Right, so the fourth pin was connected to the output of the pot signal. It was just to experiment whether or not it can read an analog value. And we realized it cannot read an analog value because it's a digital pin. 
<laughs> so Bilal, we used to actually have a calendar that Mary made that you could add to the calendar directly. There was an ICS file. We haven't made it this time, but I will definitely take your feedback back to Mary and I'm sure she'd love to make sure that there's one there for the next time it's created. Otherwise, there's something called the schedule. Uh, you can manually add some of the things to the uh, calendar. I do that. I manually add my events to my calendar. I don't think there's a direct way to convert it, but yes, you can sit down and pass it. Uh, this platform, by the way, supports MicroPython, so you all can go check it out. I'm sorry, CircuitPython. I keep confusing between the two. And that's all right, Bilal. These are all recorded. You all can always watch. If you all have any more questions, you all can come back later. All right. Awesome, folks. I'm going to close the session now so that you all have a good 10 minutes before the next session because I can see a lot of you all have been attending continuously. No worries, Santiago. Hopefully, I'll see you tomorrow. Bye, folks. I'll play some music and then I will exit. And I will see you tomorrow morning, bright and early.